We're so excited to be here today. Uh, Mark and I have spent the last 10 years passionately documenting and archiving and embracing and celebrating street art. We have tens of thousands of images and we've chosen a very select few to bring to you today that we really believe embodies um, the principles and the themes and the activism and interventionism that's happening in street art today. We are, uh, we, we love the fact that the, the website has uh, so many visitors and people go online to look at street art. We're also excited to have such a beautiful screen to show you these images, but one message we believe in is that street art's really meant to be enjoyed and embraced out on the street. So we encourage people to embrace their communities, visit cities, and get out and start walking around, and we guarantee you'll find something really inspiring. One question, can we lower the lights just a bit, if possible? Yeah, we'd love for you to see these high-res images. Um, they're absolutely beautiful, and um, you know, since street art is the first real art movement that was born and fueled by the internet, we thought it was appropriate to do a tag cloud and to pull out some of the phrases and words that will be themes throughout the images that we'll show. Certainly there's an issue of what's public and what's private space. We get criticized a lot because we talk about public space and people say, no, actually, that's a private building, that's not public. And then others will say, well, then what is public space? Things are site specific. We love artwork where it's not about just putting up a poster, it's about making sure that there's context, that the city becomes part of the canvas. It's ephemeral, so that this is all art that, that will disappear. That's really important to know. It is designed for decay. There are artists like Swoon who, doesn't, who feel that their art isn't full until it's actually starting to erode, and that's when it becomes uh, beautiful. Um, and most importantly to realize that, that this is art that, 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 as it's not meant to last, is a great complement to advertising, right? Because with advertising, you know the start date, you know the end date. With a piece of street art, you risk arrest for something that literally might last 30 seconds, 30 minutes, 30 days. The artist <laughs> never knows. So with that, we're going to jump into some images and, and, and show you what... Uh, what we fall in love with. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna really take you literally around the globe with this presentation. We're gonna start with a French artist named J.R. Um, doing work in the favelas in Brazil. He's uh, done this work also in Kenya and in Paris. He goes into uh, these downtrodden neighborhoods and photographs, um, usually women, and what he's aiming to do is bring life and a voice to um, women who don't have voices. So he's taking their eyes, blowing them up into a grand scale and bringing that humanity and we pasting it on the roofs of buildings. In this case, he did an entire favela um, to bring to life the, the voice of these women. The next artist we have um, is Alexander Orion. He's working in Sao Paulo and he's uh, doing what we call reverse graffiti. So he's going into these heavy, heavily polluted um, car tunnels and with a rag, literally removing the dirt and the grime that's been built up over time. In this case, he's putting in skulls to signify how polluted his city is. The irony with this work is that instead of arresting Alexander, they actually um, came in that night and uh, washed the tunnel and began to wash all the tunnels. Um, Alexander takes his work a step further. The rags that he used, which became uh, dirty very, very quickly, he saved. He watered them down and he took the pollution and made it into paint. He distilled it down and he uses the paint in his fine art. So he's taking it all the way through and recycling it. You know, what we fell in love with was when we really started meeting with these artists, we realized that the commitment is so strong. And we had to ask the question that uh, every time a street artist puts their art up in public space, they risk arrest. And that's 
not fun for anybody. So why on earth would they do this? And what we found is that there are certain themes that started to emerge. One was that most street artists are really looking to beautify ugly spaces. How many gray walls do we have? How much bad architecture has been put into the cities? And you have artists like Jan Vorman from Germany, from Berlin, who takes very simple Lego bricks, kids' toys, and puts them into cracks that he finds in different cities. And he did this in Tel Aviv and in, 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 in various places around the world. And the internet is such a fuel to people connecting with these very, very simple acts, but very, very important acts on a humanistic, emotional scale. So what Jan has done is he's turned this into a group performance. You can sign up and you can join a group of people that now go into cities and together with these kits that you see on the left, we'll start to fill in the the cracks. Sometimes, like in Berlin, they're old bullet holes from World War II, so they have great significance. A another amazing movement is the work of guerrilla knitters. Guerrilla knitters are mainly women, um, and everyone's laughing, but they, the, it's actually a, a big and serious movement of, of women who are out there um, tagging and they, they really believe that they're um, graffiti artists and what they're looking to do is um, take their own symbol, take a little piece of themselves, something they've handmade and put it up around the city. Um, they're also looking to provide a warmth to the city and to give it some femininity that oftentimes our, our cities feel so cold. I think we have one more uh, image. The next uh, on this gorilla theme are gorilla gardeners and this is Mastika, another uh, woman who's taking moss, sewing it to canvas, and then taking the canvas and applying it on the city streets. And this street art is meant to be touched, it's meant to be felt. She's looking to create little pieces of, uh, of livingness and greenness inside areas of the city that are, are not touched at all. Uh, this image is by Anna Garforth that, um, from the UK. And, and there's movements happening all around the world where people are focusing on, uh, on living graffiti. One of our favorites of, 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 of the last few months in, is uh, Neozoon out of Berlin, a collective. And what they're doing is they're taking discarded fur coats, fur coats that no longer have any use. Um, and they're repurposing them as these, um, uh, the, these animals and then putting them back into the city streets to make those cities um, much more enjoyable. Um, and uh, it's an action of upcycling, this idea of, that Bill McDonough um, coined with Cradle to Cradle, where you're taking something that no longer has use and creating use. Here, it's the creativity of the city. For us, city need, cities need unauthorized public acts of creativity. There's a lot that the cities can do through the governments and they can add public art, but there's nothing that captures the energy and the emotion of coming across things that were done just because the artist felt uh, a desire to do them. Um, and then the second is, is an interesting one, is that not every artist is, is, is reacting to the proliferation of advertising in our cities, but, but many of them are, and, and they're working together now, and we wanted to comment on just a couple of, of, of projects. Um, the first is um, uh, the New York uh, street art takeover in New York that was started by Jordan Seeler, a great website uh, called Public Ad Campaign. Jordan is an incredible documenter. This is one of 120 um, uh, uh, pieces of art. This was by G. Lee, who spoke last year, that were put into places where advertisements should not be. So there is um, uh, a lot of ads that are at eye level and they're illegal, and the artists are going back in and, and taking over those spaces. Yeah, uh, along the same lines is a group from the UK called Cut Up Collective. They're, they're actually going in and removing the billboard, um, putting the image into their computer and using an algorithm to remix an ad into a new piece of art. So then they're taking that ad, cutting it into pieces, repasting it together and going back out on the street to apply a new image that's made out of an old ad. 
So that's a very complex approach, right? You take the ad down, you put it through an algorithm, you then cut it up, you place each piece, it becomes a performance. But often, the same impact can be done with a very simple swipe of the pen. So a couple of images that, and if you've seen the film, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so it's very easy if somebody has a, an idea to not only neutralize advertising, but completely co-opt it. And the question becomes with a lot of this is, did the artist make that ad more interesting because of the frequency of that ad? It's not just once on that bus shelter, it's literally on every bus shelter along the way. So did they add relevance? Did they add more creativity to it? Another example is another favorite on the internet which went uh, <laughs> crazy. Um, very easy, right? Takes two seconds, but again, creates a, a, a dialogue. Um, uh, this is a, a, a more complex one. So this is Dr. Gecko. Now what he's doing is, is interesting, and I'll explain this because we didn't have the street uh, photographs, is that the ad on the left obviously is a, an ad for uh, the European uh, uh, Desperate Housewives. The ad on the right is him reworking it so that when the lights come through at night, when, when it gets dark, the ad changes because he knows how translucence will work. So he's put the ad back. So he's taken it, worked on it to create the skeletons. In the daytime, it's the normal ad. In the evening, it's the skeletons. And there's m many examples of, of this. This is another one that, that, that we, we liked um, as well. This is Ryan, and what Ryan did um, is he felt, I want to create an interactive billboard. So he created these uh, self-adhesive um, magnet yeah. tiles. Um, but what I love about this one is that the clear channel logo he created to make it seem as if it was a billboard. So he added his own legitimacy um, back into, uh, into the work. Yeah, he created his own space. So a lot of artists are uh, doing exactly what the advertisers are doing. They're using the space for their own messaging. Um, this, is a, this is an artist named Sputnik um, coming out of Germany. And when we put this up on the Wooster site, it was actually extremely controversial. Uh, we've, we got a lot of emails from women saying that this was violence against women and um, they were really offended by the piece. When we reached back out to Sputnik to understand his motivation behind the piece, um, it turns out it, that wasn't his motivation at all. He has a deep anger against Nike, um, both from the proliferation of advertising in Germany, but also from how they treat their workers in factories. And he's so angry that they're so pervasive in his society that he wanted to use Nike's own logo to, to sever Nike. And so he's trying to take their own logo that they've developed and use it against themselves. Um, What's amazing, again, about this piece is it's so simple and so basic, but such a powerful dialogue um, that happens between the artists and the community. This is another really powerful piece. Um, this is Princess Hijab, um, Princess Hijab, sorry. And she's also, again, adding multiple layers of um, culture and community and advertising in, in her work. Um, she believes she's using the subway the same way the advertisers are. She wants to reach the most number of people that she can possibly reach. And her message is that she's actually taking these models and she's making them human again by, by painting over them. Um, a lot of these pieces are done in the UK, but they're also done in Paris where there's a lot of dialogue around um, wearing head, head scarves and head coverings and community. So I don't know if, let me explain this one. This is one of our favorites as well. There's a lot of talk about photoshopping of, of fashion um, uh, and the covers. And so what this artist has done, and it's an anonymous, an anonymous artist also in Germany, um, to make a statement about the photoshopping of, of celebrities, they've added, if you can see, the Photoshop palettes 
onto the advertisements yeah. so that they're actually showing that this ad was photoshopped by adding the palettes that designers use as they photoshop. So again, taking the normal ad, having a vision of what that ad could be as a statement, at least to them, um, uh, and, uh, and going out and making it. And obviously, that uh, piece would only work um, uh, in, in, that, in that area. Along the same lines is another very, very simple piece, but, but, but quite, quite interesting. This is a neighborhood in Chicago, um, and this is an artist who um, is reacting against the gentrification of the neighborhood, the skyrocketing home prices. The way the, 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 um, the, sidewalk. Um, the sidewalk goes is that it's, it's literally a grid of these, these blocks, and um, uh, the artist uh, recognized Monopoly and created this very simple Monopoly board. If you play Monopoly, you recognize that image. And what we love about this is that that stencil could only work at that place. It can't be used over and over again. And that's really one thing, again, that we, we find so, so wonderful. Mm -hmm. This artist is Arms Rock. He's from Bremen, Germany, uh, originally from Copenhagen. And he wanders the city streets sketching individuals, going back to his studio, and then blowing them up into life size and painting them, and going back out onto the city streets and wheat pasting them up very close to the locations where he first saw them. And his belief is that people every day will walk by the homeless and the downtrodden but when they actually see his image, they stop and they think about it, and that people notice the image more than they actually notice the real human being. This is another really interesting piece um, done in Pripyat, and these artists essentially uh, broke in and started putting up images of children playing ball and having fun in essentially what is a, a nuclear, you know, wasteland. Pripyat is where Chernobyl is, and it's, it's been closed for many, it's, many years. It's been closed, and, and you're not allowed to go in. And, uh, you know, again, a very controversial piece, because no, no one's actually ever going to see this. You're not allowed in there. Um, they felt they were honoring the souls and the spirits of the kids who had played, um, but people were, were also upset that they had um, defaced a, an area of, of honor. G. Lee is an artist who spoke last year, um, and G. is, is, is um, uh, behind the Bubble Project, which is really quite interesting, and it's a fantastic book. I don't know if they have it here. And what G. does, and it's a performance, right? So you see him in a costume. He has various costumes that he uses. He literally does something very simple. He puts up speech bubbles on ads. But what the project is really about is what happens then. And what happens then is that people will write sayings in all of these ads, and there are amazing, amazing volumes. And then G will go back, and he'll photograph them. And then they'll go up on the web in various themes. And I really, really encourage you to check out the work of, of, of G. Lee, and pleaseenjoy.com is his, his website, and you can see um, the, the, the range. And again, this goes back to that question. Um, uh, did the speech bubbles make the ad more interesting because of the frequency of that ad? or did the speech bubble take away the power that the ad had to sell? And that's something that um, obviously everybody has a different opinion of. And then the last one on this section is the future, right? So everything is becoming digital. Um, uh, more ads are now no longer fixed. How are artists, activists reacting to that? So this is um, an artist from Toronto, The Pixelator. And um, what, what he's done is taken just these scrims and replaced um, these pixels um, uh, over the, the electronic billboards as you go into New York. And what happens is you have this beautiful um, mosaic that, that comes from that, from the colors of the ads that are running behind, uh, behind these, uh, these pixeled um, uh, installations. Um, and then again, we want to leave with, um, with things that, uh, that were done just literally to, to make you smile. The first one is a, a French artist named Invader, and uh, it kind of actually goes back to the beginning where we talk about site-specific work. He's using the, the pipe to his advantage with uh, Super Mario. And then another great example of, of how we could be using our drain pipes is with the, the pixelated water coming out, uh, which is another really fun sculpture. So again, you know, beautifying ugly spaces, right? How many of those 
those uh, pipes do you walk by and, and never notice. Mark Jenkins is an artist we like. He works with masking tape, with tape, with cellophane tape. So this, is a, this photograph is probably not the best way to do this because what he did is this is the mall in, in Washington, D.C. And he realized that he could create these lollies, right, these lollipops by literally just putting over these tape pieces that he had made. But he did the whole street. So as you walk down, you saw all of these different colored lollipops that, that Mark had seen. And he lives in D.C., so it was his vision of, of making... Uh, Washington into a playground for himself and for his friends and not waiting to ask permission to do it. This is a piece that... <laughs> so this is Banksy, right? So this is the brilliance of Banksy. We could show you really elaborate pieces that, 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 that Banksy's done, but for us sometimes the simplest ones are the best ones. And this is an example of what we think Banksy at his best, very, very simple piece, only could work there um, with a twist of the arm making the camera go towards the wall. This is another piece that we quite like because it really signifies the dedication. <laughs> this is Brad Downey, an American who has been living in Europe, lives in, in London. And he just wanted to do this. And the thing here is that when I met Brad, we were in London and, and and at the time that he did this piece, he did not have the money to buy a cup of coffee. But he was so dedicated to put that piece out there that he fabricated it and spent the money to do it because he, he needed to. And again, that's why I think we fall in love with so many of these artists is because they just see the city in a different way. And this piece only lasted an hour. It was only there for an hour. Yeah, it was removed. Um, Crate Man is another great group from Melbourne. And they're playing with what is really a, a lonely commute into the city. So this is right along the train track. So uh, they go out as teams and make these really large crate installations and install them overnight so that all the commuters coming into the city in the morning can have something fun to look at. What was interesting is they came over for dinner a couple of months ago. And when we met them, sometimes you meet the artists and you know what they're about. And um, it made sense. But they're architects. And, and we weren't uh, aware. But they saw the, the art through their experience in, in, in architecture. I should say, or we should say, that most of these artists are designers, designers. ironically. <laughs> and they're often working at the companies that are creating the ads that they're going back and, <laughs> and defacing. <laughs> and then <laughs> we, we also have Rhodesworth uh, coming from Montreal, Canada. And he's taking, again, something that we all see every single day and playing with it. In some instances, these scissors are actually almost look like they're cutting the cars out of the sidewalk. He's an avid bicyclist, so he's trying to, to remove the cars. There's hundreds and hundreds of photographs of these works, so we really encourage you to Google and see the diversity of the work because there's, a, there's an amazing amount of work that, that, that uh, Rhodes' work has done. Mm -hmm. This is one of our favorites as well. So I have to explain this. In the photograph, she only took one. She was really worried that she was going to get arrested. So let me explain this. This is Laura Keebler. And this is, you remember when Damien Hurst did his uh, big exhibition at White Cube with the, the uh, diamond-encrusted skull, the most expensive piece dollars. of artist. So what she did is she bought a very cheap um, skull. She took some cheap trinkets and created her own um, copy of, of Hearst's skull, and she left it in the trash to be picked up. So that's the White Cube uh, gallery. The gallery. That's the outside, and there's the trash. And I don't know if you can see, there's, uh, there's Damien's skull there uh, waiting to be, to be picked up. And again, it's just, this is her vision, and, and, um, and she saw it, and she, she went out and did it, and, uh, and the piece was uh, thrown away. And this is, again, the way we love seeing street art. So what's interesting about this piece is that the artist is Banksy. And how would you know that, right? So when Banksy was in New York, he did a very elaborate show. I don't know if you've heard about the Village Pet Shop. It was with animatronics. It was a fortune to stage. And as I went through the city, he just sees the city a different way. And he saw these two discarded phone booths. Who uses phone booths anymore? With with cell phones, and very quickly, with a quick flick of the pen, uh, did this uh, before the phone booths were, were thrown away. So we're going to leave it at that, and we're going to hand it over to Faith, and we're, we're thrilled that South Africa and Cape Town has an artist like 
Faith 47, um, and, and we're excited to, to hear her walk you through her work. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mark and Sarah, very much for speaking with us. It's a great honor to have you here in Cape Town. I'm Faith 47, and I'm going to just talk to you about my fascination with walls and with public space that I've developed over the last few years. So, I think um, one of the things that I really appreciate about walls is, and public space is its, um, its ability to speak for people who have got no voice. And I think in a society which is based uh, largely on monetary values, and um, when public space is in many ways largely surrounded by marketing, um, it's really important for us to see that space as a, a place for, um, a place I can speak for the disenfranchised and also for the individual, and to be a space that can speak for uh, independent thinking. Um, in South Africa, we have a history of political graffiti, and I think walls can really communicate ideas and ideologies. Uh, for instance, like wealth shall be shared by the people on the side of a standard bank building during the old regime. A lot of these artists um, could get arrested, killed, detained. A lot of the photos had to be sent out of the country and um, brought back into the archives after the fall of apartheid. So here's a stencil of the Freedom Charter. I remember like catching the train to school and seeing old slogans and um, stencil campaigns like the Mobilize and Mourn campaign and they had quite an impact on me when I was growing up. Uh, walls can also tell stories. They tell stories, for instance, of um, the stowaways, uh, guys who frantically want to get to Europe uh, on ships through Africa. And if you go to a lot of the harbor port towns and you look under bridges, you'll find these very specific style of uh, drawing of boats and poems, and they're really quite beautiful. Walls, walls can also be quite angry and uh, we all know the gang tags of the Cape Flats and Salt River areas. And although perhaps a lot of these images are not pleasing and they maybe make you feel uncomfortable, it's still a very honest reflection of, of our society. I also really love uh, interventions that are done not by artists, just by someone who happened to find a spray can. This one, every time I drive past it, I get a, a feeling of nostalgia, I think there's, yeah, walls can be quite sad. This one, where will I spend my happy days? It's very beautiful, and what I like about it, if you look closely, right at the end of days, somebody has scratched in, in hell. This is also a beautiful wall that uh, is an observatory, and the texture of this wall is, it's really, um, it's a hard wall to paint on, and someone's gone with a paintbrush over, a graffiti throw up, and they've uh, taken the paintbrush and gold glitter paint and really delicately written out dollars are the privilege, complete with spelling mistakes. And I mean, that is real artwork. Even uh, council sanctioned walls or signage can be quite powerful, depending how you look at them. So, what I was saying about walls being able to tell stories as well is when you, ha when you look at a a photograph of graffiti or of street art, you always need to remember that there is a whole story behind that photo. So, for instance, this um, picture is a blockbuster of myself and Prisco from Puerto Rico and Okuda. And uh, this is in the favela in Sao Paulo. So, the photograph might not seem that impressive, or the blockbuster, but there is a whole journey behind it, the weather and the old lady who invited us in to come and have water with jugs and the big freight trains that were driving past and it's like the heat of the day and running through the fountains at the end of the day in the city and it's really a, an experiential art form where you, you find yourself in very surreal situations and you experience the country 
or a city in a way that you would never otherwise experience it because you're, you're really exploring like spaces that people don't go into. Uh, over the last years, I've grown a real keen appreciation for texture. And um, I think there's a real truth and honesty in brokenness. And um, I would much rather find a neglected, lost, forgotten space to paint on as a canvas than on a clean, white, sterile wall. So when you're doing art on the streets, it's all about intervention in spaces. And for instance, like this uh, abandoned DA office that we stumbled across um, in the crossroads, which is an area in Cape Town with um, no electricity and very bad sanitation. This silhouette piece is a, um, was a completely meditative experience for me. And just exploring this high-rise um, vacated building in Johannesburg Central, like uh, the experience of painting here was um, very calming. Although there's still quite a violent energy in the air from the red ants who had obviously evicted everyone. And um, yeah, I kind of had to drag the piece off the floor onto the wall. But yeah, I come from a very graffiti oriented, oriented background. So I've got like an immense love for lettering, for fonts, for letters, for the style of each letter individually, and also how they work together, how they flow as a word. And um, for the lines and the curves and the shapes, can really get lost in the design. And I also enjoy the simplicity of blockbusters. I think that it's quite evident that the, the idea of blockbusters is borrowed from growing up in a society that, um, with such a lot of mass media advertising. And uh, with my pieces and also my characters, I, these days I really like to work with the spaces that I can find that allow my work to be alive. So um, the letters can be layers of shadows on the walls and find spaces where th it looks like there needs to be something in that space. But I don't stick to traditional graffiti. I write all sorts of different things like this uh, epitaph which is on the side of a burnt out train in Salt River. And this gentleman, this gentleman is in King Williamstown on the side of an old supermarket where these guys hang out every day. And painting this love was a really beautiful day. It's uh, all the abandoned power station on the way to the trans guy uh, in a place called Power Town which is now uh, surrounded by a small shanty town. And um, a lot of the kids play inside the, inside the building and there's a few people living there. And yeah, it was a beautiful day. This painting is called uh, Run Run, for if they catch you, they will kill you. And this is in Woodstock. Jehazardusburg is in the notorious rocky streets of Joburg. Yeah, I think it's important for the characters to work with the environment and the energies that surround them. Uh, this conservative looking man I painted when the anti-nuisance bylaw was um, passed in Cape Town, which actually makes it illegal to skateboard in Cape Town or beg, and there's a lot of laws in there. And also when the, the anti-graffiti bylaw was being drafted, so it was just a bit of a commentary on the conservativeness of the council. And um, even though it was actually a legal wall, it only lasted one day. Um, a Silent Nation, this is in Google Air 2. I think it's also important for me to say that uh, I specifically would like to use my work to challenge stereotypes of race and gender and class and to kind of, I think it's important for us as South Africans, but just generally as well, to start breaking down that sense of other, you know, and we need to start crossing boundaries. So I like to paint in all different areas, 
and I want my work to reach as many people as possible, specifically people that can't or don't go to gallery spaces. This um, is in Sao Paulo and it is titled The Injuries We Do to Others and Those That We Suffer Are Seldom Weighed on the Same Scale. And this one is called um, Commerce, Civilization and Christianity. Sorry, can I have some water? Okay, so this is the first image of a series we've been doing on the Freedom Charter. It's a new video project I'm doing with Rowan Pybus. And just a quick, in a nutshell, the Freedom Charter is a document that was put together in the 1950s and it um, comprises of the demands of the people. So it was a list of people's demands to, the, to uh, an ideal society that they wanted to create. And it became banned and uh, was smuggled around and became like kind of the backbone of the struggle. And um, so we took out sentences from the Freedom Charter and I wrote them around in specific locations like this, rest, leisure and recreation shall be the right of all. This is under a bridge in Newtown, Joburg and there's about 60 people living there. The people shall share in the country's wealth. This is in Kailicha. It's an area of Cape Town that speaks very loudly about the wealth inequalities of our city. And um, yeah, I think the Freedom Charter is really relevant right now because it is what people fought for, the ideologies, and it's, I think right now is a quite an important time to look at what did people fight for and where are we going. So this is uh, Lady Justice, all shall be equal before the law. It's in the judging district of Cape Town, in the court district. And the people shall govern. So a large wall I did in Market Street, Johannesburg, a few weeks ago. Also play around with some wheat pastes. This is part of a, a series called Home, just using symbols. Very quick to put up. And this is my dark angel. It's a bit of an anti-war um, image. And this is her flying above um, Joburg taxi ranks. Also do illustration. Sometimes, this, is, this went to a show at the Think Space Gallery in LA, it's the Wheel of Fortune. I try not to do any commercial illustration. Uh, if I do, then it'll be hopefully for something like this with the um, Art South Africa magazine where you can really have freedom of concept and style. And I've really been spending a lot of time in the studio working on um, show, um, work for shows, for galleries. And this is My Lady Justice. I'm starting with the really old antique frames and working with oil on wood using gold leaf and uh, the engraved veneer borders. Uh, this image is entitled uh, Hold Fast. And it's a completely different working process than to working on the streets. And I find equ both equally satisfying. Here's that same image, the commerce, civilization, and Christianity. Uh, these two went to a show in France in the end of last year, Mama Forgive Your Sinning Daughter, and What a Woman Wants, God Wants. And lastly, this is Fortuna. She's going, um, she's going to my first solo show in Hamburg in August. So, yeah, one of my favorite artists is my son, Kia. And this is what he painted on his 11th birthday. I think the reason why I also I'm showing you this is just to say that really the work I do is, uh, it's not a job, it's, it's um, kind of part of a philosophy and a, a, a lifestyle. So, that's kind of all I have to say. But thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, Mark, and Faith. And here to present you with Anglo Platinum Pins is Mike Shallot, Chief Creative Officer of uh, Network BBDO.
And we have some uh, questions, actually, from the uh, um, SMS line, sure. Sure. If, you're, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, one is, um, do you believe, and this could be uh, for all three of you, I think, is there no line between um, art and vandalism? Is every act of expression to be applauded? Faith, do you want to start on that one? I think everybody, everybody is entitled to make up their own opinions on that. I think there's an authenticity that comes with, with an act. We, we, we uh, say, uh, you know, unauthorized or with, uh, without asking for permission. Because once you use the word vandalism, you polarize people. It used to be when we were written about in newspapers going back 10 years ago, every article was about vandalism. Now, 10 years later, because the internet has celebrated the creativity of the people in our streets and recognize that we have to have this. That if you took away graffiti from New York, New York would be Main Street Disneyland. That there's now a balancing of the scales. And not every street artist is looking, as even Faith said in her, in her remarks, to take a beautiful wall and ruin it. They're going into spaces that have very little and adding beauty or creativity or a message to that. And so I think that's, that's how we would react to that question. Yeah, th oh sorry, go ahead, sir. I was gonna say that uh, cities have explored with creating these legal walls or areas of um, where the artists are allowed to paint. And, and I think, and Faith could probably talk to this more, but it's not as motivating because uh, the artists are looking for, uh, to put their piece up in a place that has meaning and, and their message can connect to that site-specific It's about context, and context is everything. And, and you, the space that you want to have the context, you can't ask for. Now, it is true, though, that if you want to go big, I mean, there's pieces that, that are shown that the scale means that you can't just do it. You have to ask for permission. So I don't think every street artist is loving the fact that they have to do this illegally. But um, until they decide to go big, uh, they are certainly much more um, suited to, to just On do it. On the other hand, also in South Africa, I mean, I've found that it's actually very easy just to ask people and people don't, people like you doing something but in, why, you in know, their environment. Why, why it's is not that like you have to go in the dead of night and yeah. do this, you know. You know, I think the artists ask themselves, well, why, what, is, what is beautiful and what is ugly? Why is an ad beautiful or acceptable? I mean, it, it, it can't be beautiful. I mean, we love advertising. We wouldn't be here if we didn't think that advertising can add to a city. It, it often does. But the question becomes is, is, why is a Gap ad accepted in your neighborhood, but a piece of street art made by the hand of an artist is, is worth three days of, of jail time. That's the question that, you know, that, that's asked. There's, a, um, uh, there's another question that came in, and I, I, I think when I read this, I was thinking of uh, Troika's presentation this morning, you know, uh, uh, where they were commissioned by MTV to, in effect, uh, enact a, a protest against the very awards show that MTV was putting on. The question is, uh, can you guys think of examples of brands press related to um, uh, the artists that you're uh, talking about today, where they've been con where they've been hired by brands uh, consciously to do this sort of work to, in effect, promote the brands? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's one artist, but you know, brands are always looking for authenticity and for energy, and there's, without question, you can see it in the images, you could see it in Faith's work. It, it very rarely works. And it, it, it's not that artists and brands can't collaborate well, they can, because a lot of these artists work with brands, they just don't do the type of work that they're doing on the street with the brands. The question what, really becomes is what, what's the motivation? Yeah. And, and I think with, with the street art, you can see that person's hand and you know that, that that, that it was made, I don't know, with, with passion. And, and as Mark said in the very beginning of our presentation, ads have an end time, they start and end. And the artists are, are just out there and they're gonna make pieces and the weather's gonna tear them down and they're gonna go back and put more pieces up. Sarah, Mark, Faith, thank you once again for thank this you. extraordinary, thank beautiful you. work, very inspiring. <laughs>